Well, church, I'm very excited to bring the word this morning. If I'm completely honest, I'm going to give this everything I got because I am running off minimal sleep, terrible coffee, but in many, many God encounters. Um, I'm at that stage where I'm not afraid to say this in church. Instant coffee doesn't do anything for me anymore. Don't judge me for that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what's changed in my life, but for some reason, it has to be a latte. Um, but I... I come to you this morning with a simple message, but I believe it's not just for our young people, even though this is part of our youth camp session. I believe this is for all people. And um, if it's your first time being in the room with us, maybe you've never been to Shiloh before, we're so glad that you're here. Maybe it's your first time in a long time. Uh, We we really do honour the Word of God. And uh, we've had many, many moments over youth camp. But last night I talked specifically about how we need to be renewed Uh, by the word of God. Our mind is so precious and so needing of us to be renewed by the word of God. So as we're here this morning, let the words that um, this humble vessel brings to you to renew your mind. Um, So I want to welcome everyone online as well. If you're joining us via the stream or you're hearing my voice, um, it's a little croaky because of the lack of sleep. But I also want to do Matt and Angie Hannah, our our Rangers leaders and kids pastors. Um, Don't clap for them just yet. Uh, have put a monster effort in for this weekend. I don't know if in the room, but Matt, we do have something for you guys uh, that we want to bless you with before you go away. Um, but Matt and a bunch of crew got back to the campsite at 2.30 a.m. this morning after coming back last night and bumping in so we could have church. So for that small crew of <laughs> Navy SEAL specialists, um, can we just thank them as well? We honour you guys. Um, Uh, Let's pray, and then we're going to get into the word. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for what you've done this weekend. God, we pray that today you would keep moving, you would keep imparting, that you would mark us, that even as the youth camp has a theme, I pray we would all be awakened, we would come alive in the name of Jesus, that something on the inside of us would shift. Father, whatever needs are represented in the house right now, I pray you would meet them. I pray we would move from where we are to where you want us to be by the end of the service. I pray we wouldn't just turn up to tick a spiritual checkbox today, but we would turn up to encounter the living God. I thank you right now. Holy Spirit, breathe on this word, encounter this group of people that we would leave differently. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our youth camp this year, I really believe in prophetic themes. I really believe that there's power in seeking God and getting a word. And I really felt this year for our youth camp, God gave me the phrase, awaken. And I really felt specifically it was to awaken young people to the reality of the kingdom, that there's more to this life, to awaken them to their identity in Christ. Because who knows, we need some secure Christ-centered young people coming through the ranks in today's society. And I also felt it was to awaken them to the purpose and plan God had for them. Because we don't want to just know about the kingdom. We don't want to just have our identity, but we definitely want to know what the plan and purpose God has for our lives. And my message for you this morning is simple, but I believe it's going to impact you. The title of my message, if you're taking notes, is Marked for More. Marked for More. I want to read to you Ephesians 2, 1 to 9. I want to highlight some things out of this verse, and then I believe as you receive this morning, you will walk away knowing that you're marked for more. It says this, made alive with Christ. How fitting after the songs we've just sung. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. It's a great start, Darren. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He in the spirit is at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. If God says it, it might be wise just to do it. Just a side note. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very own nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God. (laughs) Uh, I'm not going to lie. I just had a song go through my head that I'm not going to repeat. But but God is a good part. But God is a good part because he is rich in mercy. And he loved us so much. That even though we were dead because of our sins. I love that Matthew 1, 21 says that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. I love that. Even though we were the ones that have fallen short, we've missed the mark. Jesus came to save his people. He already called us his. It wasn't those people from their sins. It's that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Even though they were dead because of our sins. He gave us... Life that when he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us, fitting RJ, 
with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of this incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. As shown by his grace, as shown in all that he has done for us united with Christ, God saved you by his grace when you believed. You cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So no one can boast about it. First point is this, saved for more. Saved for more. When you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you immediately became a part of the family of God, but it doesn't stop there. If you know that you have received this grace, this kindness, this mercy, I don't know about you, but every time I think about the finished work of the cross, I don't just get stuck in my feels and go, man, it's so nice that I'm saved. I get in this moment and this position where I'm like, wow, Jesus, I cannot believe you have shown me this love, this grace, and this mercy, and it makes me want to share it, show it to other people. What I'm really talking about is we've received the gospel the good news. You know this. You're all experts. I understand that. But I think we can sometimes miss the power of the good news. I think in 2023, we need to live proactively in this, this fact and this reality. I've been saved. I've been born again. When's the last time we had a conversation about being born again? I don't mean physically. I mean spiritually. That would be weird if it was physically. Um, born again. We've been saved I can't boast about anything in my life because it's all the grace of God. I love that Paul says, I've worked harder than all of these, but I am what I am by the grace of God. I don't want to ever be someone that boasts about what I'm achieving because everything that I have in my life is a byproduct of the fact that I've been saved by grace through faith. I think it's a powerful thing for us to reset as we go into the second half of this year, as we've spent time away, young people, that you've been saved for more. You haven't been saved just so you can get the golden ticket, the spiritual Willy Wonka bar, so you can go to heaven and that's it. No, no, no. If we've been shown kindness, grace and mercy, we have an opportunity to show that to a world that is dead in its sin. Sin is just missing the mark. It's an archery term. We need to be really good at remembering that I am not the byproduct of everything that I've done. Yes, you have free will. Yes, I'm sure you're hustling hard. But we have been gifted the person of Jesus. Oh, I just want to be really good at remembering that I've been shown grace. Grace is an interesting thing. I grew up in a church where grace was everything. And I think that's wonderful. But it was to a point where we didn't understand the fact that we were saved from something. It was just grace, 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 grace. What are we preaching? Grace. What are we doing? Grace. And it actually softened the understanding that God had to pour his wrath out on someone. And that was meant to be you and I. Um, Pastor Phil, if I'm really honest, this whole youth camp, it's not just been like entertainment, speaking in tongues and just praying for young people. If God's really given me some heavy messages. But as we've had altar calls and moments, it's been really interesting that the feedback has been, hey, can you, can you give us the truth of God's word? I heard this statistic that Gen Z and Gen Alpha specifically, Gen Z will believe an authoritative text if they can somewhat have an understanding of the leader or a relationship with the text that they're reading. But Gen Alpha, that's the grade, that's the age 12 and up that's coming through. They will believe what they can comprehend. They will believe what they can comprehend. So that means that you and I, if we're saved, we have to live out this simple gospel because there's a world that even if they get presented something and it's not the truth of God's word, if they can understand it, they'll believe it and they'll make it truth. That's really convicted me this weekend because I just want to do a good job at representing Jesus well. I want to know that I'm saved for more, that when Jesus saved me, it wasn't just for me, but it then flows over to my family. It flows over to my son. It flows over to our youth ministry, that because Jesus saved me and I have an understanding of the grace of God, I can't help but do this. It's not just because someone said, hey, you get to hold a mic in your hand, because I never wanted to do this growing up. I skipped school. I definitely milked the fact that I was in a wheelchair. Don't judge me. It's just, I just, you know, I didn't want to do stuff, but I just, I don't know. I just can't help but talk about Jesus. I can't just help but share about what he's done because I've experienced his grace. I've experienced his grace. It's like I just can't stay idle in my faith. I, I knew where I was heading. I knew what I deserved. But because of his grace, his richness and mercy, I just can't live the same. 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 13. It's the, 
the moment, we've, we've probably all read this scripture, but as I was thinking about this morning and it being part of our youth camp, um, I was thinking about how David was a shepherd boy and he was in the unseen. He was overlooked. He was just doing his own thing. And I felt the Lord bring me to a few parts. But I want to read the scripture for you. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him for being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil. If anyone has a horn next week, I want you to bring it with oil. I want to see how this goes. I will send you to Jesse, to the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hears it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and he will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for for me him who I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and he came to Bethlehem, the elders of the city and came to meet him with trembling. He came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peacefully? And he said, peacefully, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go. (laughs) Or his stature. I don't even know what happened at camp, but someone asked the question, how do you get taller in our boys' session? And the mic ended up in my hand, and everyone just started laughing. I was like, what a stitch up. Oi, facts. King David was not necessarily tall, but we'll keep going. (laughs) Or his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. We talked a lot over this weekend about the fact that society tries to put labels on us. And I heard this thought this week that whatever informs you, forms you. What are you allowing into your life? What are you you allowing people to say over you? Just because they might misunderstand what God's doing in your life, be very mindful of the labels you allow people to look on you. Because God's not just looking at the outward appearance. Amen. I haven't done my push-ups in the last 24 hours and I'm feeling it. Um, God's not just looking at the way that you operate. He's looking at the heart. He's looking at the heart. Young person, you're going to get um, ridden off a lot in life because people won't understand maybe the way that God's wired you, but God's looking at your heart. Maybe for the 40-year-old in this room, you had a dream when you were younger and you felt like God anointed you for something, but you've allowed the opinions or the misconceptions of what people have said about you to stop you actively living in the God call that God placed before you. God's not just looking at the outward appearance. He's looking at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab. What a great name. Someone should name their child that this year. We'll bring that back. And made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. You really feel for the brothers in this moment. And Jesse and his seven, seven of his sons passed before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? Awkward moment for David. Hey, he was not invited. He said, there remains yet the youngest. Um, I always say this, that... Um, my dad had to keep trying for children until he was like, yep, we've made it. And um, I'm the youngest of three, so he looked at me and he's like, we've made it. Uh, no more. Um, so I feel for Jed, but anyway, we'll keep going. Um, it's a joke, people. It's all good. God loves everyone. And Samuel said to Jesse, my brother and sister hate that joke, honestly. They're like, oh, your dad's favorite. I'm like, it's not me. It's biblical. And he said, and get him. <laughs> For he will not sit down till he comes. You can see that I'm tired. One of my youth leaders just texted me saying, bro, is your eyes even open? Um, And he sent and brought him in. Now, he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Hey, you don't have to be tall, but man. Amen. I think Holly has said this about me this weekend. I don't know. Must mean I'm anointed. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. You can have fun in church. Come on. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. For Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. My second point is this. You're marked for more. Last week at our youth ministry, we had this moment where I preached a word called marked. And this is kind of a part two. And I had RJ come up on stage and I had a paintbrush. And every time it represented that every time he encountered God, that God was marking him and I just slowly started putting mark after mark on RJ. And I was just encouraging our young people, your best encounter is your last encounter. 
When's the last time you've just encountered the presence of God? Man, I don't, I don't want to live this life without the anointing of God. Now, I don't mean physically we have to go all buy horns and start buying a lot of canola oil and just like dousing each other. But what this represents is the Holy Spirit came to David and he's like, you've been marked for more. David was a shepherd boy. So young people, you may have a dream in your heart. You may have something that God's spoken to you and you don't know how to get from here to here. If God's anointed you, he's going to work out the distance. For some of us in the room, maybe you remember having a youth camp or youth conference experience. And you remember the moment you encountered God. Can I remind everyone in the room today that if Jesus is the anointed one and we're Christians, it means we're anointed ones. That we're all marked for more. David was being anointed as a young man, but it was many years before he would become king. I've learned this lesson really painfully and Pastor Phil helps me on a weekly basis to realize that God has me in a process and that process can't be rushed. He's super kind. Um, when we have our one-on-ones, he'll be like, hey, Darren, um, you're being an idiot. Nah, he doesn't actually say that. Um, he says it a lot more pastorally, but it is a really healthy, healthy understanding that I'm like, wow, I'm in process. Um, you cannot bypass the process of God. Have you ever felt like you're going in the same situation or you're just going around and around and you're like, why do I always find myself in this same situation? Maybe God today wants to say, hey, I'm trying to take you through a process. And in that process, I'm trying to get something out of you so I can get something into you. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting something to change. Maybe the cycle you're in, and young people, let me me help you. God would rather help you than have to heal you. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. God wants to take each of us through a process. It's called this, it's called this thing sanctification, big word, but it means we're just being, being made more and more like Jesus, more and more like Jesus. So if we're anointed and we're marked for more, let's not try and skip the process of God. Um, it's not like you can hopscotch this thing. You have to go through each step. I heard it said by Oswald Chambers that spiritual maturity is not reached by the passing of the years, but by the obedience to the will of God. You may have read your Bible for years. You may have been in church for years. But the test in the process is will you be obedient? In Luke 8, 4, 18, it says this, that, and this is speaking of Jesus. And he says this, and there's a beautiful scene about this in The Chosen that came out recently where he gets up in the synagogue and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Why does God anoint us? To bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim to the captives that they may be released, that the blind will see and that the oppressed will be set free. Acts 4, 13 says, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures, but they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. That's really good. I'm not saying you shouldn't study the scriptures, and I don't think that's a a pass for me not to progress in my understanding of the word of God. But aren't we grateful that God doesn't say you have to have all the qualifications, you have to have every T crossed, every I dotted before you preach the gospel, before you move in your anointing, that he's saying, hey, the key marker is that they noticed they had been with Jesus. Young people, I would love to encourage you that the difference in your life will be daily just getting into the Word. Daily. If you can establish this habit now, you will save yourself a lot of heartache and pain. I'm speaking to everyone in the room today because the reality is we're anointed for a work. We're anointed. And I've preached about this before and Pastor Phil has preached about this before. And I just feel this morning, you've got to understand you're marked for more. You're marked for more. What you are experiencing right now isn't the total sum of what your life is about. You're marked for more. If God has anointed you, then there are things that he wants to get to you. But like I just said, it's the process of God bringing things out of you to get things into you. But you're marked to preach the gospel. You're marked to make a difference. You're marked to be the light in this world. And the key thing is we don't have to have it all together. We just need to be people that regularly, humbly meet with Jesus. Meet with Jesus. If I could get um, the keys back up. My third and final point, and I told you this morning that I wasn't going to preach for long because I want to pray for some people. You're made for more. You're made for more. You're created on purpose for a purpose. I think there's an identity crisis happening 
in probably most people's lives, but I, I specifically keep an eye on the next generation. I love all people, but I feel like God has marked me to fight, to hold the line on the next generation. And there is such a confusing cultural moment in society right now around identity. You can put two and two together, but for me, I, all I know is I'm watching and I'm looking and I'm like, man, I, need, I feel like it's a burden away from God. I need to help the next generation understand who they are in Jesus. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. Hello. So we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. You and I are God's masterpiece. May we not allow the voice of the enemy, the labels of society say less about what God created. Psalm 139 talks about how God knits you together in your mother's womb. That the DNA and the details of God Himself are woven into who you are. You and I were God's masterpiece. We're His masterpiece. When He looks at you, He says the same thing He said about Jesus at His baptism. This is my son. This is my daughter in who I am well pleased. We're not here just to exist. We're not here just to go through the motions intrinsically from the moment you were conceived to the moment that you were born, God has made you for more. We're saved for more. We've been shown grace. We're marked for more. God has anointed us, but we need to remember and always come back to this reality. I'm a son of the King. I'm a daughter of the the King. I am saved. I am marked, but man, I know that God has made me. And He didn't just make you. He formed you. I don't know about you, but I'm terrible at assembling furniture. I don't have a craftsmanship bone in my body. But on the same breath, I never pay attention to the manual. So this is a real conundrum in my life because I know that there's the instructions, but I always feel like I can do it without. But has anyone ever gotten Ikea furniture or came up furniture and just been like, why is there these two extra screws? What's this about? You start inspecting it and like, where did I go wrong? Like, I was really confident, man, I'm not good with furniture. But I I reminded our young people of this, like that when something's been created and designed by someone and they put detail into it, like God has created us and put detail into us, the Word of God is the thing that we need to keep coming back to, to form our identity, to remind ourselves of who God has called us to be, who God has created us to be. Renew your mind, renew your mind. The Word of God in Scripture is described as a two-edged sword. And I really believe this morning that there's some people here, you need to allow the Word of God to cut through the lies of the enemy. You need to allow the Word of God to cut through what the enemy's tried to put on you or tried to embed into your heart and your mind. We're saved. We're marked. We're made for more. To do good works. Faith without works is dead. We're saved. We've been created to do good work. So young people, after this youth camp, you can't go back to just living the life that you had before because God's done something. And if He created you, that means that you have this opportunity to do good works. It's not going to necessarily be the most popular thing. But what we do need is a generation of young people to step up and say, I'm going to be the difference. Do a good work in your school. It may start small. Walk over to the young person that doesn't have a lot of friends and don't worry about what other people think of it. Maybe you're a young adult in this room. Do good works in your university. Live a life that represents Jesus. Well, if you're a business owner, I understand there's a lot of financial crisis going on right now. Do good works. Because God prepared them for you long ago. Long ago. We are created to do good works. The reality is, church, that this is a youth takeover. And I... I'm addressing the young people, but this morning I just come with a simple message. You're marked for more. Your life cannot just be the total sum of what you're experiencing and you're doing. And through the Word of God, I want us to remember this morning who God says we are, the plans and purposes put before us. Maybe RJ's right in the first half of this year has been really hard and you're not where you want to be. All your New Year's resolutions, gone. All the, maybe some of the hopes and the dreams financially or in family dynamics or in your studies or your workplaces, you're not where you want to be. I really believe that if we can establish ourselves 
in these truths this morning, the second half of this year, you could just see God take you from strength to strength, glory to glory, that there could be a real difference. What a great message that was. Hey, we're so glad that you could join us for our online service. If you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, all you have to do is repeat after me and follow along in this prayer. And it's, Dear Jesus, I give my life to you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. That you rose from the dead. I need you as my saviour. Help me to live my life for you and you alone. Thank you for your love, your forgiveness and your grace. I thank you for a new start. Amen. Hey, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, congratulations. We are so excited about the decision that you have made to follow Jesus. There are three simple steps that we'd encourage you to to follow along. First one is to tell someone, tell a friend, tell a family member. Hey, if you don't know who to tell, tell us. We'd love to hear about this exciting new decision that you've made. You can email us at mail at shilohchurch.org.au or you could just drop us a message through Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. The second thing is get a Bible. And along with that, we've got our foundation course online, which you can subscribe to. It goes for 12 days. We're not going to spam you, but it's going to help you along this journey. And the third thing is get connected and find a church. Hey, if you're new to the area, we'd love to have you with us. Come and visit us at 9.30 on a Sunday morning. We'd love to meet you and see you face to face. Now, as we come around the time of us bringing our tithe and giving our offering, I want to encourage us out of Proverbs 3. And it says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. What God is trying to get to us here is that when we trust him, we actually can be entrusted with more. It may be older terminology for the day and time this was written, but realistically what it is saying is when we trust God, He's going to direct our steps and in that process, He can bless us with more. I love that when I bring my tithe and I give my offering to the church, it does two things. It positions me for a blessing and it positions our church to reach out and bless others. I love that we have departments like Shiloh Cares that feeds multitudes a year and at the drop of a hat, in case of an emergency, we can practically love our community. I love our missions efforts overseas where we get to build local churches, feed the poor, and we get to equip others to do the same for their communities. So right now, I want to pray for you and your family as we bring our tithe and give our offering. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus and we just ask for your blessing, your favor, and the overflow of your goodness and your grace to flow into every family, every business, and every person. God, we thank you for those that generously give give week in, week out, because it helps us reach more people for you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.